We're good. There we go. We're good. This has been a approaching an 18 year relationship. And uh, the reason I talked to Brian about having Daryl and I uh, have this conversation is we've never really had it in public. Uh, how we met, how this is, uh, how things evolved and the important ship, the importance of uh, mentoring and paying it forward. So uh, why don't you kick it off? Sure, I, uh, I, was, I think probably some of the reason why we haven't had it in public before is parts of it are best left that way. Uh, but uh, you, you, and I, uh, you and I have talked a lot uh, in the past about, uh, about how to get started in this industry and obviously you were uh, a big part of that, that for us. Uh, but there, there's been different stages of it. There's been lots of different uh different different parts of the industry but you got started in a very different part of the industry than i did uh you were you were college radio for the most part was that the, I was first, doing the college. first part yeah I, was doing, I, I went to ithaca college here's my uh, alma mater here and uh, i got kicked out for spending more time in the radio station than i did in my classroom at the uh, communication school and i got sent back to cleveland where i talked my way into a a uh, nice Jewish boy from Shaker Heights. I talked my way into a Jesuit college, John Carroll University. Uh, and the radio station there was basically about uh, the, the uh, Bible hour, the whatever. And two weeks later, I ended up running the college radio station and we went rock at a time before WMMS existed in Cleveland. So I ended up getting adopted by a guy named Billy Bass. Some of you might know him. Uh, I think Judy, you know Billy. Billy was a disc jockey at Wixie Radio in Cleveland. And I happened to meet him at an event and he goes, I like you. And I started hanging out with him. He introduced me to uh, a guy named Frank DeLeo and a guy named Steve Popovich at Columbia Records. Uh, Frank DeLeo went on to manage Michael Jackson and Popovich went on to uh, score one of the biggest albums ever, uh, basically signed me love. And they adopted me, they mentored me and I was told to drive from Cleveland, where I was from, down to Cincinnati to interview for a job at Columbia Records. I interviewed. When I got out of the interview, I called uh, Frank DeLeo and I said, well, well, I know if I had the job. He says, no, you had the job when you drove down there. You just had to go through the interview. So that was the beginning of them basically looking out for me. And it started my whole thing with, you know, having a mentor complex. And I ended up going to Warner Records and doing artist development and Phillips and whatever. But at every point, I would think back to how had Billy and DeLeo and Popovich not adopted me and mentored me and helped me and opened some doors, I may still be running my father's dry cleaning business in Cleveland, which isn't a bad business either. But uh, I ended up going in a completely different direction. Probably not as much fun. No, you know, but the fumes are good. Um, you know, I, I went in a different direction because I had a love of music and I met people who, you know, saw something and they took care of me. And so I've had this thing about helping people. And so in 2003, in the lobby of this hotel behind me here, that is the Harbor Castle, uh, I met Daryl. And you take it from there. Yeah, well, I mean, we had gone through a bunch of different stuff. I was... I was a student at the University of Waterloo at the at the time, and we had tried unsuccessfully in uh, in in 2000 to get licensing for a lyric website, and uh, I I got invited to be on a panel at Canadian Music Week at uh, in 2003 as like the student uh, the student pirate the student representative uh, of what what the kids were doing in those days. Uh, and that was, I had like a, a, a discman that played uh, MP3s like burned onto a, uh, uh, onto a CD. So I could have 200 songs on one CD. And, uh, I remember that that sticks in my mind as like a crux of our first conversation, Ted, of you and I standing there, uh, you being at EMI at the time and, uh, it, and going back and forth of me saying, you know, this is what I want as a consumer. Uh, and 
can you can you license this? Can you sell this this to me? And you saying, well, no, but this is what I want as a, a as, as a record label, would you buy this? And me saying, no, but, <laughs> and back and forth and back and forth, we, we, we went. Uh, and, and obviously, yeah, and obviously that ended up then leading to me working uh, for you and, and having, you know, my four months of, of crash course education uh, during a, a co-op work term, uh, working for you at, at EMI Music in LA uh, and, and that. And, you know, one thing led to another that what we, when we ended up uh, relaunching Lyric Find as, as B2B uh, in 2004, 2005, that you were the first call that, that I made. And, and you talk about having your person that, that adopted you. Uh, and, and, and for, for me, uh, you you were the first person to adopt me uh, and, and and guide me through this crazy industry uh, that that we're all a part of uh, for sometimes some unknown reason uh, and and now here we are many many years later uh, and, and trying to you know, keep progressing and and as you say pay it forward. So, pay it forward. I mean. We've worked together at Canadian Music Week a bunch. Uh, we started the uh, hackathon, the not the hackathon, but the startup competition together. You took it over a couple of years ago. Uh, is that is that part of how you're, you know, finding the person that you're going to adopt? Yeah, I, I think that that's part of it. So, I mean, you, you're giving me too much credit when you say that, that we started it together originally. Um, you you asked me to pitch in it originally when you were doing it, but I had nothing to do with the, the creation. But then, yeah, we revived it uh, in, in 2016 um, and, and have done it every year since. Obviously, this year, uh, no Canadian Music Week uh, so far, so it, it's, it, it's not happening. Uh, but we have, we've provided, <laughs> we, we've provided, uh, you know, not just you know, marketing and promotion for it, but also prize money uh, towards uh, towards the winner. Uh, it's it's been every year uh, money contributed by Lyric Find and, and by SoCan uh, to to try to fuel the next batch of startups. So we've had a ton of great companies that have come through there. Whether it's companies like Jamstack and Side Door and Audio Kites and and Cinervas and and many many others that have gone on to be successful or be acquired and a bunch of other ones that I have not heard of since. Uh, but as uh, as is the case, uh, you know that's that that's part of the process. So uh, it, it's it, it's been a key part of what I've what I've tried to do to help help the industry and and help in particular in Toronto. Uh, along with that, I, I've recently gotten more involved with um, the Ryerson University Music Den, an incubator there uh, for uh, music and, and particularly music and technology startups. Uh, so that's been uh, uh, a, a good uh, way to get involved more and, and help to you know, hopefully give people a little bit of advice, give people some information uh, and, and tips and introductions so that they don't make the same mistakes that I did. They can make new mistakes and maybe I'll learn from those. Hudson is on here. I can't see through the screens, but uh, I go and speak at her class every year and scare the class. This was good this year because we did it remotely. So I wasn't accused of touching, of touching anybody. Um, last year I put my hand on a student's shoulder said, you're David Lee Roth, and I'm dragging you into an interview. And, oh, there you are, Jones. And uh, she sent me a note afterwards saying, you can't touch the students. I said, emotionally or physically? She said, either way, just stay away from them. But meeting the people, <laughs> you know, going into a classroom and seeing people through a degree of optimism, naivete, enthusiasm, whatever, put forward ideas that you know you would say 
well, that, that can't happen. But we're luckily, the industry that we're in was based on, we'll never do MP3s. Oh, wait, we did do MP3s. We'll never do subscription. We'll never do all you can eat. That happened. They're never going to license lyrics. And so we've had, we've had the pleasure and the, uh, you know, uh, anxiety of basically convincing people, you may not want to do it now, but you are going to do it. And if we look at the film industry right now, it came out in the paper today that uh, AMC theaters are not going to show Universal Pictures because Universal said, we like this idea of day and date release now of movies. Ten years ago, it was said that if a studio ever released a movie day and date, it would be the end of theaters. It took this, you know, unfortunate, uh, you know, situation right now to get them to go to the table. The movie industry is not going to be the same. So yeah. who do we, we think is going to win that battle? I think the studio is going to win. Yeah, me too. I think the studio is going to win. What's going to be interesting is they're not showing Universal Pictures at Universal CityWalk AMC Theater. That's going to be a real interesting one. Uh, but we have been in a business where we're basically knocking over things that people said we can't do. You went through a lot of use cases. You're going through one right now where you know trying to kicking and screaming in some cases and in some cases there's a lot of visionaries get people to realize that we have by putting lyrics up on amazon or putting them up on uh you know where, wherever uh, on google that's not the end of the game that's just the beginning of the game so what are some of the current headbutting uh, you know let's say initiatives that you're looking at well i think in, in general especially with international uh, expansion, we always run into uh, whether it's, uh, it, it's technical issues, it's, or it's a new type of, of licensing. Fortunately, that's relatively minimized now, but, uh, and just being able to, to, when we're entering a new country and, and getting all the local licensing, being able to, to educate the associations there, the publishers there, and others about uh, not just the potential for revenue from uh, from us directly with, with lyrics, but the effects that that has on overall music consumption, uh, on, on on fan engagement, uh, and the trickle down effects into things like uh, like concerts when they eventually start again, uh, and uh, and you know album sales, track sales. Uh, merchandise sales and all the other things by creating a better fan experience and, and the additional data that can come out of it. Uh, so being able to go through that education process is something that we have done many, many, many times. Uh, it's gotten a lot easier than it, than it used to be, but still has its challenges, particularly in international markets uh, when we're, when we're first uh, really getting serious about a particular country uh, and you know, it, it's a challenge now in any of the new products uh, that we launch as well that there's you know in general often in the industry hesitation uh, for new things and you know lots of people in the music industry have been screwed over in various ways in the past so it can be it can be justified uh, but you know there let me interrupt you for one second that's an interesting point you make the great thing is we get to innovate. The bad thing is we're an industry that has been based on the belief that you're going to screw me, so I'm going to do everything I can do to prevent that happening. So I'm going to get the biggest advance from you that I can get. I'm going to get the lowest, the best terms I can possibly get. I'm going to do all these things, which inhibits long-term partnerships. It's how do I, you know, if it's a label or a publisher, it's how do I make the quarter, you know, uh, with, you know, what's the advances that are coming in, as opposed to this thing's brilliant, but it's going to take five years for it, you know, to be a juggernaut, but we need to get involved with them now. And I know we've run into that, uh, you know, uh, to be open uh, after Daryl graduated and after I left EMI, I joined the board. I've been on the board of Lyric Fund for 14 years, and it's been amazing watching the company grow. But every once in a while, there's these moments where Daryl will say, eat a piece of bread so you don't say something that's good on the other side of the table. 
Yeah, there, there was, I needed a lot of this at various different times. Uh, I, I, I promised Shane that we would crack the traditional lyric find keg during my panel, but I decided that fireside chat was more of a, a wine type of occasion. But uh, uh, yeah, the, there's a history in the industry of, uh, of, of right, rights holders in particular, uh, just get it going from advanced check to advanced check and companies dying. We were fortunate enough uh, that that didn't end up applying to us. And it's the only reason that we survived and were able to build a sustainable business and a sustainable uh, flow of royalties to the publishers is, you know, and it gets back to you know, being adopted and, and, and having the, those mentors and those people that help you. We had people that believed in us and, uh, and supported us through it and saw that this was truly an incremental revenue stream. And it wasn't something that was at risk of cannibalizing existing business because there wasn't an existing uh, Lyric business. So you know, one of the great examples of that uh, for us was Lauren Apolito at HFA who we went through the whole deal process was she really understood everything that we were trying to do and, and, could, uh, and how to aggregate the licenses for us and help us get through it. And, and it's ingrained into my head of, we went through negotiating this whole agreement and there was a blank in the contract uh, for what the advance amount was going to be. And uh, like, all through the process up until like the very, like the week before it was signed, that blank did not get filled in and we had not discussed it. And we didn't have any money. We, we, we were a startup. Uh, like the, the only money we raised was $50,000 Canadian from my mother. And, and we couldn't afford to pay any big advance. And I was terrified of that blank, that it was going to completely derail everything and we would we would just be we we would be dead in the water, uh, and then at the very end, and Lauren filled in that blank with a tiny number, uh, and I signed the deal right away, uh, just to 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 get it done and 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 take advantage of it. But it was because she believed in in what we were doing, saw the value in it, saw the long term potential, uh, and you know we've been we've been great partners with them ever since. And I, I can't say enough good things about how that relationship has, has been, but it, it could have very easily gone in a complete different direction. If, if that one person hadn't believed in what we were doing uh, and, and adopted us as a partner. A great mentor in Milt Olin. And, you know, Milt was a phenomenal human being. And we suffered the loss of Milt when he was, you know, when he was tracking. And, you know, you'd think that that could blow. And Jeff Levinson stepped up, who I'm looking at right next to you on the screen here. It's really, are you seeing it? Trippy. I mean, Jeff stepped into that role and became a member of the family seamlessly. And it's it doesn't feel... I'm saying I'm, I'm not pitching business for you, Jeff. He doesn't feel like he's a hired gun attorney sitting at the table. He's part of the he's part of the family. He's part of the team. And can I tell the Ron Dinelli story? Uh, yeah, yeah probably. Okay, so I'm in Orlando, Florida, at uh, not at uh, CTIA, and I'm at the Peabody Hotel, and I'm looking out the window at the convention center. And my phone rings and it's Jim Rondinelli and he's working at Warner Chapel. And he said, I was just offered $250,000 by one of your competitors to not license Lyric Find. He says, I know how important it is to you. And I love Daryl. Tell me that if you don't get the license from us, it'll kill the company. And I'm going to turn down the money and go to Scott Francis and tell him we're not taking the $250,000 exclusive fee. I said, Jim, think of my life right now. Daryl's put his life into it. Mo, who's not here on this with us, uh, uh, Mo Mutadine, who's uh, Mohammed Mutadine, who's Daryl's co-founder, uh, 
He says, I love you guys. I'll go deal with it. And he called back and said, Scott said it was okay not to take the advance, and we got the deal with Warner Chapel. Jim could have said, it's a quarter of a million dollars. How can I turn this down? I'm taking it. Uh, I'm sorry. If, you know, I can't prevent the collateral damage. Uh, it's about mentions. It's a good people. And we've been very to uh, go through, you know, to have that ability. So when I met the Music Den people from Ryerson in Belgium at uh, Wallafornia, I was very impressed with how they approach it. And I, I have no hands on experience how do you how does how does that work and, and what's coming out of that well the, the music den it's you know, it it's like an incubator but one that doesn't uh it doesn't take equity it provides space it provides resources from the from the university provides mentorship uh and connections into into the industry uh for uh, stretches of, of time, of effectively semesters and, and periods, people are admitted for uh, roughly a year gen generally to have space and grow the grow the company there. Uh, so it's it's a great resource, and you know, the the steering committee will all meet, uh, you know, from time to time to hear pitches from uh, people who want to uh, to join the den. Uh, and and be part part of that, uh, and then we 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 talk about you know, do we think that they're a good fit? How can we help them? Uh, should they uh, like are they ready to come in now, or are there a few things that we can give them to steer them in the right direction, and maybe they'll be be ready in a couple months? Uh, so it's really a great uh, structure. Uh, a guy named Cormac McGee. Uh, runs it uh, and, and manages everything there and does a great job of it uh, to make it really easy for the rest of us. Uh, but it, it's a great, great facility. They just moved into a new space uh, and it's right downtown Toronto. Uh, so it's it's a great location for everybody. So if there are people out there who are uh, interested in, in, in doing a music startup and want to uh, uh, be part of a great incubator. I, I highly recommend checking it out. And uh, Canada is an awesome place to be right now. Uh, so it, it's it's a very uh, great program that I'm happy to be involved in and, and and honored that they would have me as a part of it. What's next product wise? By the way, I have to say it. I think I thought I was having a staring contest with Dan Mac did, and I realized it was a still photo. Uh, anyway. I was saying he's winning. What's the, what's that? And Dave Parker. This is great seeing everybody here. This is like, you know, except for not having a, a, a margarita, this is going really well. Um, and Judy's been with me when I've had a margarita. <laughs> Too many margaritas. Uh, what's next product wise? What do you see for what, what's things that we haven't thought of for lyrics? And, you know, what, what, what's the next door to break down? So there's a bunch of stuff that we've been, been working on. Um, I, I talked about it briefly in the, uh, in the elevator pitches when uh, Brian put me on the spot, so I was happy to, to, to talk about it a little bit. But uh, a lot of what we're doing now, aside from the continued uh, growth uh, of, of content and languages and licensing and international expansion, uh, which we've done a, a lot of lately, uh, we, we've been working a lot on translations, which is a big product that we've, we've rolled out. Uh, to really try to it, connect the world and get everybody uh, together and understanding uh, the rest of the cultures. I think especially in you know, times like this, uh, when we are going through this crazy shared global experience uh, of coronavirus, uh, it, it's that much more important to be able to connect with other, other cultures and other, other countries and other uh, parts of the world to understand you know, their mentality and you know that we're all we're all in this together uh, so the the translations product is a great way for that to work and uh, we we've also developed a word by word sync technology uh, which opens up a whole lot of doors when it comes to UI and user experience stuff uh, and, uh, and 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 beyond that doing some really deep uh, data diving uh, into the lyrics themselves. So uh, one of the things that we're, we're about to launch 
uh, publicly, and I was, I was saying earlier that if this was all in person, we'd have a big demo set up for it, uh, is uh, a, a product we're calling Lyric IQ, which is essentially uh, deep data analysis of music through the lyrics. Uh, and it has a number of different facets to it. Uh, one is, uh, is looking at the emotion and sentiment analysis of, of the content uh, based on solely the lyrics. So that's, it's a partnership that we're doing with uh, the IBM Watson team who have some great technology on, on this that we've been able to, uh, to, to play with and, and, and modify and, uh, and that. And it essentially evaluates the strength of each of the main emotions in the Dalai Lama's Atlas of Emotions within a particular song based solely on the lyrics. So instead of looking at how a song sounds, we look at what it's actually about. So the classic example of that is, is Pumped Up Kicks, which sounds like it's a happy, fun song, uh, but it's about a school shooting. So it's definitely not happy and fun. And if you're a, a streaming service and somebody asks you to play happy songs and you play that, that's a, a, a big miss. Uh, so, uh, that is a great and amazing tool and also with overall positive and negative sentiment analysis in there. Uh, we've developed some really complex content filters based on the lyrics. So if you want to know uh, what the level of just regular profanity is, uh, sex, violence, drugs, uh, politics, gambling, a pick a pick a category we are scoring every song based on the content in each of those categories so you can apply those filters to a music service to uh, in-store or retail environments uh, to sync licensing or that to weed out the things that are inappropriate based on what types of categories are actually inappropriate uh, some people might not care if if a song says fuck, but they might care if it talks about gambling, uh, for example. Uh, and then even getting deeper than that. We have two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, la the last part so is, you one. <laughs> is, is deep subject matter analysis. Um, so it, it's looking at uh, locations that are, that are mentioned, brand, brands, uh, yeah, um, celebrities, holidays, uh, all those types of different things. Uh, so, and tying those locations together. So if you have a song uh, that mentions the CN Tower that we know that that's part of Toronto, that's part of Canada, uh, and that uh, enabling the brand side, enabling uh, ad targeting applications uh, and the, the other data for playlisting, recommendations, uh, voice search and commands and that type of stuff. So lots of different uses uh, of those, uh, those those pieces of data and categorizations. We're going to end this now. We don't have time for questions, right? No, no, uh, but we'll put you in a breakout room. Okay. Um, I love everything that we've done with Lyric Find, except if you're ever over at, uh, at our home with Maggie and I and five of her girlfriends, I'm not sure that you need to let her display the lyrics for Bones, Thugs, and Harmony and have six women singing along with the lyrics. It's just not, it isn't pretty, <laughs> buddy. And join us in the breakout room if you want to keep going. Great, right. thanks so much, guys. We thanks appreciate everyone. it. Thanks, Bye. Brian, Kushana, and everybody else for putting this together.